So let's get started with our class, and before we begin with our study, let's have a word of prayer together. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, thank you for the night's rest. Thank you for this new day, this new week. And especially, Father, that we can begin each week with the Lord's Day, coming together as your people to worship you. We're, we're grateful, Father, for the wonderful blessings that we have in your Son, Jesus the Christ. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your Word, <coughs> to think about spiritual matters after a week of working and dealing with the world and all the things that we uh, associate and deal with on a daily basis. We're grateful for this spiritual respite, and we ask, Father, that you would bless us today so that we can live for you each and every day as we seek to follow your Son, Jesus Christ, in our life. Father, we ask your blessings on our study this morning that we can learn and grow. We are grateful, Father, for the opportunity to be here and the help that you have provided to each one of us that we may be here. We know, Father, there are some not among us this morning because of health problems. We ask your blessings upon them that they may recover and be well so that they can be back with us once again. Father, we are grateful for your Son, Jesus. We're thankful for his love and his sacrifice on the cross. We're thankful, Father, that through his work, of salvation that we have the blessing of being your family, your people. And Father, we pray that we would never forget Jesus' wonderful sacrifice and that we would remember his body and the blood that he shed and what he gave and the love that he had for us so that we could be free from sin and that we, we could be part of your family. Father, thank you so much for all of these wonderful things. Help us, Father, to love one another as Jesus has loved us. Bless us this morning as we seek to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week we started verses 10 through 16. And we were discussing... The, we're continuing to discuss the qualification of elders here and also what their role is specifically in regard to what Paul describes as insubordinate people. Verse 10 here, idle talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. And we were asking the question, who are those of the circumcision last week? And we were talking about, well, they were Jews, but specifically, probably, Paul is referring to Jewish Christians who still believe that you've got to keep the law of Moses. And specifically, that Gentiles are supposed to keep the law of Moses. If you look at Acts 15 for just a moment. Uh, this is where the apostles got together with the elders of the church at Jerusalem, and also the apostle Paul was there in Barnabas. And notice verse 1 of Acts chapter 15. And certain men came down from Judea, and they came down from Judea to Antioch uh, of Syria, where Paul and Barnabas were working at this time, and taught the brethren... Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so they were trying to find a doctrine that God had not found uh, on Gentiles. And so Paul and Barnabas had some strong words with them. Verse 2 says, and so they went to Jerusalem, all of them. And when they went down, they met with the apostles and elders, and the conclusion was that um, God had not found the law of Moses on the Gentiles. And in fact, we see uh, three different areas of evidence. Number one, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, uh, made it clear that when the Gentiles were first brought into the church, 
there was no such uh, uh, requirement made of them. And then James spoke and um, quoted the scriptures, and he said that in the scriptures, that the Gentiles were going to call upon his name, and that the scriptures testified that they did not need to obey the law of Moses. And they're not to be troubled, verse 19 says. Um, and so they ended up then writing a letter. Verses 23 uh, is the entirety of that letter. It's very short. And it basically says, um, well, uh, 23 through 29. And it basically says that um, they don't need to be circumcised but they do need to abstain from idols and from blood and from things strangled and from sexual immorality, verse 29. And so no greater burden than these necessary things is what the wording says there in verse 28. And so that, of course, was uh, not objectionable to anyone, and so they went forward to do the work after that. So when Paul talks about the circumcision here, he's talking about those who would come into the churches and then require Gentile men to be circumcised. And verse 11, he describes um, not only these, but also others, insubordinate, idol talkers, those kinds of personalities what they do when they come into the churches. Verse 11 says, Whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. And so, when he's talking about the, the things that they would teach, now he includes the circumcision in this list, but this he's not just talking about the circumcision talking about more than that because in verse 12 he speaks about Cretans and Cretans those are uh, people who lived on the island of Crete native to the island of Crete now today a Cretan is like an oaf or a, uh, a person who's uh, sort of not very sophisticated you know he's called a Cretan uh, somebody who's backwards so to speak but um, the, uh, the notion back then, though, was simply one who lived on the island of Crete. But Paul describes them in verse 12 as being liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. <laughs> so not very complimentary, you know, of uh, the Cretans here. They're included in this group that Paul is discussing in verses 10, 11, and 12, of whose mouths must be stopped. And so it's not just those of the circumcision, but it's those who are like the Cretans as well. And what is the problem here, the main issue that uh, surrounds these particular type of personalities or people? Well, they are self-willed. More or less. They want their way instead of submitting to the way of Christ. And, and you know, you can make any issue an issue that is associated with this kind of attitude, right? I mean, it can, it can be the color of the carpet. It can be the kind of coffee that you buy. It can be a doctrinal issue that, you know, you insist that must be, you know, uh, sort of uh, managed and always paid attention to to the, to the nth degree to the point where nobody can breathe, right? Because of the insistence of one person seeking to have his or her way. Self-will is the idea. Now, don't, don't misunderstand me. I'm not... I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't be doctrinally right. We should. But sometimes older preachers would refer to a preacher who was always harping on one particular issue as someone who was riding a hobby horse. I don't know if you remember that term or that term. It means anything to you. But that's kind of the attitude that Paul is discussing here 
in this uh, particular uh, paragraph. Those who would harp on their harps <laughs> about one thing and one thing only and always be up in arms, so to speak, about that. And you can't hardly talk to such an individual about anything else because anything that you say will always lead them back to that one issue and they will never relent. Well, this is a destructive attitude to have. And it is an attitude that will destroy churches. Notice Paul says that their mouths must be stopped because they subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. And so the real motives behind such individuals usually have to do with their own selfish desires, such as, Paul says here, dishonest gain. In other words, there's such a thing as honest gain, right? And of course that's working and then earning the money that you receive by uh, putting in a, a reasonable amount of work in exchange for that. That's honest gain. But there's also dishonest gain. And dishonest gain is when you seek to swindle people out of their money or swindle people out of their loyalty or something like that, right? Where instead of, of, of doing things the Lord's way for the sake of the Lord and His message, it is a selfish approach to things. Only designed to, to have one's will be done, regardless of what it might be. It could be the issue of circumcision, like Paul mentions here. It could be the issue of gluttony, like he mentions in regard to the Cretans. You know, lazy gluttony. Don't take away my potlucks from me, right? <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, but... Uh, that's, that's the idea. Uh, it could be anything. It, it's, it's not just one issue that Paul is trying to identify here. He's trying to identify an attitude. An attitude of discontentment that is then going to raise an issue, that issue which is then going to be used to drive a wedge in between people so as to cause division. And that's ultimately where these individuals are headed. They're headed to divide. They want the church to be divided so that they can have their way. And if they're not in charge, then nobody is going to be in charge. And they're going to destroy that which they cannot have control over. And so that's, that's a bad, bad attitude, a bad situation to be in. Um, in a congregation. And unfortunately, the same attitude still persists today in the churches. And it's something that we have to constantly be aware of. And we ourselves must be humble enough to constantly uh, have that sort of self-reflection to ask, well, am I behaving this way or am I uh, behaving the way that Jesus wants me to behave? And that, of course, is a question that we need to uh, examine regularly. We ought not to make any issue an issue of division unless the Lord made it such. All right? Unless it's something the Lord said, now this, you cannot compromise this. And there are some of those. Uh, we don't want to compromise the Lord's teaching. Uh, but at the same time, we want that teaching to be done in a loving way, in a kind way, a respectful way, a way that is going to bring unity, not a way that is going to create division around us. And so that is the attitude that Paul is trying to uh, talk about. And elders have a unique role in this regard. Elders are those who are supposed to watch for the flock and to understand the personalities and to see when somebody has this kind of attitude 
so that they can go in and they can talk to people like this and say, now look, we're not going to have any of that here. Uh, we are a peaceful congregation and we love peace and we want peace and we want unity. And we're not going to have any, any divisive attitudes come in. And, and that's something that elders are supposed to be constantly watching for. That's what their purpose is. Verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Okay? Now he's talking about elders in this passage, not preachers. <laughs> and uh, you may think, wow, that, some, that's really something. You know, normally it's the preacher who, who's uh, supposed to think about things like that, but not in this case. It's the elders who had that responsibility. And so um, the elders are to be on the lookout for these types of individuals. Now, verse 12, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Now look at what Paul says about that in verse 13. This testimony is true. <laughs> you know, uh, it's interesting that Paul uh, uses their own people to condemn them, right? I think that's a, a good point. When Paul says that this, this uh, one of their own uh, said that they are liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons, and then he says, and he's right for saying this testimony is true. So his evidence then is the evidence of their own people, more or less. Now, obviously, uh, that doesn't mean that every single person on the island was a, a liar, an evil beast, or a lazy boy. This is, this is a, kind of a, a generic statement. It's not intended to uh, categorize every single person uh, into these uh, areas. Certainly, Titus was on the island, right? And uh, there were other Christians who were on the island as well, no doubt, that Titus was ministering to. And those individuals... Paul would not lump into this category. Um, it's, but he's telling them, he's telling Titus now, uh, when you, you get these elders, they need to be in place so that they can watch out for these kinds of people because, in other words, what he's saying is, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. And, you know, that's, that's one thing I think that in the church, we tend to take for granted the generous, kind-hearted, and spiritual nature of our people a lot of times. You know, people in the world don't act like people in the church do. There's a big difference between them. And sometimes we have an opportunity to be out in the world and see exactly how people act. Now, most of the time when you're in a public setting, people are going to behave well. I say most of the time. Because they know that if they behave poorly, then the police are going to call, get called and they're going to haul them off. But people in private are saying things, doing things that will cause your ears to burn, more or less. And that's the kind of thing Paul is talking about here. But even in public sometimes, we get glimpses, you know, on the nightly news of poor behavior. In this country and the awful things that they do. Well, a lot of people are like this. And as Paul said, liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Let's take that first category, liars. Um, not too long ago, I finished a book um, called, uh, well, I wrote a book for article on it recently. Not that one. Another book. Um, it was about how people didn't tell the truth. Post truth culture or something like that. Uh, the post truth era, yeah. And I, I recently had a bulletin article about it, but it went into all the ways that people tell lies. And oh man, I didn't know there were that many ways to tell a lie, to be honest with you. But um, 
because there's a tremendous amount of lying that goes on in this country and all over the world. And lying is almost considered to be, well, no, I won't say almost. It is considered to be acceptable behavior in just everywhere. And there's just about only one place where it's not considered to be acceptable behavior. And that's in the Lord's church. And that's, that's a, a tremendously amazing thing to me uh, because you would think that of all the things that a person wouldn't want to do would be to lie. But people lie all the time. It's interesting. I, I'm in the uh, Rotary Club and, and another, uh, some other folks that are in the Rotary Club are a, judge, a couple of the judges here in the county. And Jeff Addison is one of the judges and he was in the Rotary Club and, and uh, we were talking about this idea of lying. There was an issue of Rotary Magazine that talked about it as well. Because one of the things that we say in Rotary Club is, is it the truth? You know? And um, But a lot of people really don't care about whether it's the truth or not. And Jeff was talking about how many people get on the stand and just flat out lie. And you would think that in that setting, sitting in a witness box, you know, being told, that, having sworn that you swear to tell the truth, that you would tell the truth. He said it happens all the time. People lie all the time. Even in that serious of a situation, and it's just mind-boggling. He said, he said um, they, they lie, and then the, the attorney will show the pictures, and, and they'll look at the pictures and show them in a compromised situation or something, and then they'll lie again. You know, they just lie over and over again. Um, it's almost as if they don't even know they're doing it. Now that is a bad situation to be in. Just lying habitually like that, and you get in the habit of lying so often that you don't even recognize you're lying yourself. Wow. That, that's a dangerous situation to be in, isn't it? Because what truth are you going to tell yourself to help you become a better person at that point? And there isn't any. You're just going to continue in whatever lies that you want to tell and believe yourself. So, always liars. Evil beasts. Uh, what was it? Not too long ago, uh, President Trump came out and said that some members of the MS-13 gang were animals, and you know they are, and because of the way they behave, they behave just like animals. But um, the opposite political party got in a big uproar about that, you know, because he was calling humans animals, and. Uh, I thought, you know, the Bible calls some people animals. And right here is one of those passages. Evil beasts. Now, why do you suppose that Paul would say this is true, that they're evil beasts? Because there's a certain point you get to when you are so uh, morally degraded and depraved that you behave just like an animal does. You're no different. You're not using the conscience that God gave you. You're not using the free will that God gave you to intervene in those situations where an animal would just lash out or an animal would just kill or destroy or, or retreat or, or pursue its passions, its lust, whatever it might be. Um, and some people act just like animals. Now, that's not saying that they are literally animals. It's saying that they behave like one. All right? And of course, everyone understands that except opposition political parties. But um, look at uh, Jude, the book of Jude, because Jude also calls certain people animals or beasts like uh, Paul does here in Titus. Um, Jude, verse 10. He's talking about the same kind of evil people who come in and, and create havoc in the church 
And he says, But these speak evil of whatever they do not know. And whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. So look, like brute beasts, uh, just acting like animals, pursuing whatever they uh, feel they ought to pursue, and not holding themselves back from those passions. The difference between a person who's acting like a human and a person who's acting like an animal is that a human being can stop himself or herself from giving in to one's physical desires, one's carnal desires, okay? And there's some people who just won't do that. There's some people who just won't give in to carnal desire. And they, they act just like animals do, uh, according to the Bible. And so, evil beasts. And then he calls them lazy gluttons. You know, I think laziness kind of goes along with gluttony to some degree uh, because uh, uh, gluttons uh, who eat a lot, and this is sort of a, uh, a general, a generic statement. I'm not saying that this is the case of everybody. Look, you can be thin as a rail and still be a glutton, all right? But, you know, the typical picture of a glutton is somebody who is overweight and uh, who has a, a lot of problems because of it. And, of course, uh, laziness then is an attitude that such a person might have because it's too hard then at that point to get up and really do anything because they have put themselves in a situation where it's too hard to do that. And so... Uh, Paul describes them as lazy gluttons, or uh, he agrees with the description, their own description of being lazy gluttons. Laziness is also a uh, sort of a, a carnal desire. Um, it is a desire to avoid work, a uh, desire to not uh, do things that need to be done, and uh, in such a way so that one becomes unable then to participate in his own care to a certain degree. I'm not talking about somebody who's sick or ill or disabled or something like that. I'm talking about a capable person. And when a capable person cannot participate in his own care, uh, that is laziness. And that's a, a bad situation to be in. Verse 13, this testimony is true, therefore rebuke them strongly that they may be sound in the faith. And so um, Paul tells Titus, he says, these kinds of attitudes need to be rebuked and rebuked sharply. It could be tempting for Titus to hold back because he, maybe he wants to be friends with these folks. Maybe he wants them to approve of him. Maybe he wants uh, to have some kind of acceptance or something along that line, every single person uh, wants approval and acceptance and acknowledgement. And when you confront somebody about their sins, uh, that can be a difficult situation to uh, navigate. Because most of the time, people don't want to be rebuked sharply. <laughs> right? They don't like it. Because you're pointing out something to them that they need to change. And change is difficult for us. Uh, change means that I need to be somebody different than who I am today. And a lot of times when people are told to change, they look at that as being an identity issue. And as a result, they may have an identity crisis. And they can take it personally. And a lot of times people will take it personally because they identify with their sin. When you identify with your sin, then any effort of another person to try to get you to change is going to offend you. And it's going to uh, create in you a, a situation where it becomes a confrontation with that person instead of an opportunity to grow spiritually. You know, we are not defined by this world. That's one of the reasons.
reasons, Jesus came to free us from the bondage of sin. He said in John chapter 8 and verse 32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But look, we've got to believe the truth, and we've got to practice the truth. And if we don't practice the truth, the truth isn't going to set us free from our own chains, our own bondage to sin. And one of the things that we've got to do to be free from the bondage of sin is to receive criticism, helpful criticism about our spiritual state. And again, that's the most difficult thing to do. That's the most difficult part. Um, because of the way that we identify with the things we've done with. Well, I've always done this. What's so wrong about that? Well, uh, uh, you know, I like eating so much. I enjoy it. Or smoking or drinking or, you know, doing drugs or whatever it might be. That's just who I am. And we have a culture that actually promotes and legitimizes sinful behavior as legitimate identities, right? Think about the homosexual movement in this country and what they say. That's who you are. That's who you were born to be. And you should not contradict that. You shouldn't tell us we're wrong. That's offensive. Why, why is it offensive? Because they have identified with that issue. That's how that's, they, they decided that's who they're going to be. And in making that decision, uh, then when you tell them to change, you're, you're not simply just pointing out a behavioral problem that needs to be corrected in their mind. You're actually attacking them personally. Okay? Now the Christian is going to look at this and say, yeah, you know what? I have behavioral problems that need to be corrected. I'm a sinner. I need to repent. I need to have that penitent attitude always and be ready to change should somebody approach me and say, hey, you know what? We need to talk about a few things. The Christian is going to have a good attitude about that. But not somebody who is identified with the sin and wants to embrace it. They don't see it as just a behavioral issue. They see it as an identity issue and a, 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 an issue of their um, being. That's who they are. And to suggest a change in that area is to suggest that you don't accept who they are. All right? Well, what God is trying to teach us is this. That all sin, regardless of what it might be, whether it's homosexuality or fornication or alcohol or drugs or, or any, anything else, gluttony, whatever it might be, whatever sin that you can think of, what God is trying to teach us is this. Sin is not who you were created to be. Okay? It doesn't define you. It doesn't have to define you. Who does define us? Jesus Christ defines us. Alright? And so that means that we can be separated from our sins and still maintain our true identity. Okay? Separating our... A lot of times people think, why if I give this up, it's going to kill me. It's just going to kill me. I've heard, I've heard people say that. You don't think people would say that. I've heard people say that. I can't, you know, let's say they have a, a, a bad, a wrong, sinful uh, situation they're in, you know, fornication, a relationship that they develop. If I give that up, it's going to kill me. It won't kill you, first of all. <laughs> It'll actually set you free. It'll help you. It'll make you better. But they, won't, they don't want to believe it. And so people will invent the greatest justifications that they can possibly invent in order to cling to their sins. Alright? And 
here's the deal. Here's the deal. If we go into eternity defined by our sins, then guess what? We're going to be lost. We're going to be lost. Because going to eternity defined by our sins means that we didn't accept Jesus. Okay? And you say, well, what, what makes a person defined by their sin? Here it is, right here. When you refuse to admit it's a sin, and you deny that that's what you are. All right? When you deny that you're in a sinful situation, you actually become defined by that sinful situation. That's the irony of it right there, the little. Yes, ma'am.
so, and that's uh, important for us. All right, let's see. Verse uh, 14. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. Jewish fables and commandments of men. Again, these are basically self-justifications. These are ways to justify sinful behavior is all that they are. How do you justify your idolatry? Well, we've always done it. Well, what is that? That's a commandment of men. That's tradition, right? And so because of the tradition that's in place, that's ongoing, and nobody wants to change that tradition, nobody wants to question it, we continue to do it, and then real change can't take place because the commandment of men has now become the justification for your behavior. Jewish fables, there's another area of self-justification that can be used. You know? Well, why, why do you behave this way? Well, listen to this old wives' tale that I've heard long ago. And it says this, you know, Okay, well, uh, all right. Uh, somebody says, well, you know, a long time ago, somebody gave me some advice. And I've always followed that advice. And it's been good advice. I've never departed from it. And well, what becomes in conflict with the Word of God? Well, the advice has to come first in those people's mind. Because, again, that's a self-justification for the sin that someone is in. And they would rather embrace that which is comfortable than to embrace the idea of change. And change is not comfortable. Change is difficult. And so that's something that we um, don't want to do. All right, these things are self-justifications. Let's stop right there, verse 14. Let's pick up verse 15 next time, and hopefully we'll get to chapter 2. Also, thank you for your comments this morning, your kind attention.